Now the report is out. Hey, comrade, want this position? To our macho, yeah. I'm to our macho, and it's all yours. This is what uh, Gams has put up today in the standard share of national bribe by public institutions, according to a report there by the ESC. Almost all of the publications are actually looking at that as well. If I may just run you by, if you missed it, a nation of bribes. There is no free government service in Kenya. Everything has a price. And according to 2023 National Ethics and Corruption Survey, the average size of bribe paid nearly doubled to 11,625 from 6,865 in the previous year. With the usual suspects, including counties featuring in the list of shame, they all, the public service by average size of bribe paid also is listed on the front page of a daily nation. And the star is cutting the same as well. State office or offices where bribe loads rule. Yes, it reports show interior, health and transport are the most corrupt ministries. Four and five is a story. And the nation of bribes as well is on the front page of the People Daily. Avery survey reveals most corrupt state agencies, counties and services. Uh, Kenyans are unlikely to access until they part with cash. And all that is broken down for you, likelihood of bribe, bribery demand in public institutions from traffic uh, to the National Construction Authority, and the prevalence of bribe payment in counties. Nyamira has taken the lead there, 100%. That we have also Kisumu at 100%. This is the top 10 leading counties as far as the vice of corruption is concerned. Hongo, Nyamira and Dio Babayao. That is the story. We ran you by that particular story. And this is what is headlining the, of course, the cartoons as well, or not really headlining, but captured in the editorial pages as well, and to say leading. And also KQ is out of the hall, so to speak, as far as loss making is concerned, trying to climb out from that particular hall with the recent reports of their share of profits. And also, we, we know that WRC, that is Safari Rally, all roads are leading to Naivasha right now according to editorial cartoons. We want to focus on the civil servants who oil graft monsters. We're talking about corporate governance in public institutions. Mongozo Code is there, but uh, that just remains a Mongozo Code a codified publication there of how officials in the public sector should be streamlining themselves as far as ethic is concerned. But we are all none the wiser as far as those Mongozo Codes are concerned. Holy Court this morning with Dr. Habil Olaka, who is the CEO of Kenya Bankers Association, Exxon Iraqi, who is a lecturer, University of Nairobi School of Business. Also, we have with us Dr. Martin Olo, who is the head of the department, School of Law, Easter University, also advocate of the High Court. All right, let's just focus now on corruption a bit. Uh, we begin with you, uh, Exxon Iraqi. Now, looking at these depressing headlines, the statement from ESCC, I think we've talked a good game in this country about fighting corruption. But that just remains to be a talk. ESC will do its job and, you know, come up with a report and give us a list. But are we making any traction in fighting corruption in this country? Looking at the Transparency International Index as well, we seem not even to be getting better, but sinking lower and lower and lower. Where are we headed? I think before we go to that topic, let's, let's finish with the issue of uh, fertilizer. Because <clears throat> I, I get concerned when instead of solving a problem, you bring some spinning and some PR. Yes. Because the Kenyan public is entitled to the truth about any scandal or anything that is pointed as corruption. Because at the end of the day, whatever there is smoke, there is fire. And one of the questions I'm asking is, if you look at fertilizer as a farmer, would I not better pay higher price for fertilizer than paying cheaply for fake fertilizer? I think one way to solve this problem of fake fertilizer is to let the market do its work. The prices will go up, but you'll get more people coming to supply fertilizer and by extension the price will go down. Mm -hmm. So one way to solve that is let's go the market way. Corruption. First let me confess, whatever is reported in the media today is not news. I think the media is just confirming what we have already suspected, that corruption is very prevalent in this country. And I'm wondering what, uh, if you are a tourist coming to visit this country, or an investor, or a trading partner, or even a child growing up in this country, and these are the headlines we confront every day. Mm -hmm. What will be the consequences? And, and my, my submission is that I don't think we have ever been serious in fighting corruption in this country. That's my opinion. 
We have not, there are institutions that are supposed to do that, but I don't think they do their work. And taxpayers fund them every year. There's a budget for corruption, there's a budget for the police, there's a budget for every institution that does that, the judiciary and so on. And I think that we have not had concerted efforts to fight this vice. And the reason, my suspicion is a lot of people benefit from corruption. And that's why it's very hard to fight it. For example, we used to fight to talk about corruption at the national level. Then devolved the government came. Mm -hmm. Corruption was devolved. Mm -hmm. So even the people who are not thinking about corruption now think about it because it is closer to them. In fact, one of the reasons why the corruption was so popular is because people in the counties wanted to have an action of what is happening in the national government. They are deals, they are contracts. Now we can also handle them. So and, and until we have a concerted effort at the national level, and mm, the person who would drive anti-corruption and stop corruption is not the politicians, it's not the institutions. It is a voter, because the voter is the one who is most affected by corruption, but is the most docile on supply chain of corruption. So the moment voters come and say, our MCA has been implicated in corruption, let's call him back. Our MP has been, corrupt, our M, uh, our MP has been implicated in corruption, let's him call back. Because when you are killing a snake, you hit it on the head. So let's look at the people who are perpetrating corruption, either at the grassroots, either at the top, and we punish them. We, there are roles that, that, uh, there are roles that we can use to punish those who are corrupt. Mm -hmm. Until we do that, even next year we shall sit here and talk about the same. Mm -hmm. So you're not making any traction at all? Uh, but you can see the index uh, from uh, 60% to 80%. That clearly shows that we are becoming worse. And my fear is corruption might become a way of life. And a lot of people get in certain positions in the public sector, not because they want to serve the society, but because they want to benefit. And they know that will be done to them. So what is happening is that more and more people are saying, ah, if you cannot beat them, you join them. Mm. And that's why it is becoming such a pervasive issue, such a pervasive cancer, that we think the ball has a problem, he is not corrupt. <laughs> not if you are good. Right, but let me, let me hear from uh, Dr. Hablion Laka how it, it really fares in the private sector as well, because it, it, it swings both ways, and it takes two to tango, as they normally say. Uh, I don't know how you've managed or how you're managing with the private sector to fight this menace of corruption because it becomes such a broad topic. Sometimes you cannot really uh, get granular with it because you wonder where do you begin, right? Even if it's corporate governance, it's just one constituent of fighting corruption. There's so many, you know, wills within this particular uh, umbrella, the canopy of corruption. Yeah, Debal, I think you're right in the sense that, um, you know, what you mentioned about that it takes two to tango. And normally in any corruption uh, incident, they'll normally be the giver and the taker. Somebody's paying for a service that he should otherwise get um, um, you know, without, without that payment because they're entitled to it. More often than not, one party will be the private sector, and the other party would be the public sector in terms of you know, um, the government machinery. And I think from the private sector, we have tried to seal the loopholes mm. that originate from the private sector and you remember we drove the the bribery act mm -hmm. um, uh, driven by the private sector through kepsa and yes. you know we managed to get something something on the table trying to seal some of the loopholes that were clearly um, um, coming up but i think one critical thing that comes out of these headlines in the papers about you know um, um you know the prevalent cases of uh, of corruption i think one that one thing that comes out of it is the fact that um, we are then able to identify the for example the institutions that are most um, um uh, prevalent in terms of corruption yes and what we should do is rather than just pay lip service to such, such kind of reports i think they give us a starting point mm -hmm. in terms of the fact that for example if the identification is the fact that ntsa or the police service or um, or uh, whichever institution that is um, uh, being pointed at in terms of corruption we then focus on those institutions and put in mechanisms of how to move the corruption incidences from where they have been reported to to a lower um, state. Mm -hmm. And like for example, if you pick on NTSA, um, are you talking about, for example, um, uh, the traffic police or uh, you know incident of traffic being uh, laid off? And I saw the chairman of ESC yes. mentioning something of the fact that um, we are going to leverage on technology to ensure that we tackle this corruption head on. So. 
For us in the private sector, for example, we have actually found that leveraging on technology eliminates quite a bit of the corruption incidences. In the banking sector where I come from, leveraging on technology has been able, has enabled us to eliminate quite some of the fraud incidences. I'll give an example of in the clearinghouse, mm. you know, the check truncation system that we put in place. Uh, every, you know, incidences of check substitution, which is a major, major problem in terms of fraud mm. in the banking sector. Just by virtue of bringing in automation and bringing in the check truncation system and ensuring that instead of having physical documentation flying across, we now have it digitally transmitted. We eliminated that problem instantly, mm -hmm. you see. So I believe in all these cases, leveraging on technology, and most of them you are actually able to eliminate. For example, you know, you are caught by a police, uh, traffic policeman, and uh, you know, normally that's the incident because you then have got to pay something to avoid, you know, um, being taken forth. And so you end up paying to the traffic police. Now, if that process was automated to the point whereby you now pay digitally, the money actually goes to government to eliminate any possibility. Of course, we know that you can also be able to infiltrate the system, and rather than pay that money to government, you could be paying to the MPESA um, wallet of this police officer. But through cameras and all that, you're able to eliminate to a point whereby the incidences of, of, of uh, leakage of mm -hmm. that, of that, of that um, resources is actually minimized. Mm -hmm. So I believe this report is a starting point and we should use that report to ensure that you identify the areas and eliminate them one by one by putting in the necessary mechanisms. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, when you talk about police, I think also there was a suggestion that uh, we should be having uh, body cams. The, the security officers should be wearing body cams so that uh, we can be able to see what is happening on the ground as well, taking just leveraging on, on technology. I think uh, that was one of the suggestions. But I wanted just to pick up on the issue of legislation. Even when we're talking about uh, corruption, we had uh, recently Member of Parliament, Mbere, this is Ruku, who was seeking to amend the, the anti-corruption uh, and economic crimes bill 2023. And uh, he was seeking especially to delete uh, section 45, sub section 2 of the Act uh, by deleting the two offences prescribed in parts 2B and C, namely the failure to follow procurement guidelines and engaging public funds in an unplanned project. Uh, so he's seeking to de decriminalize non-compliance with procurement guidelines and engagement in an unplanned public projects. And uh, it, it terms them as administrative matters that are better addressed through administrative action as opposed to criminal prosecution as is the current case. And we know procurement is where everything is really rife because uh, we've had even the president saying, you know, all this begins with budgeting. Budgeting is where corruption also is budgeted during the budgeting process. But if we have legislators who are coming up with such a bill, I've been, I don't know, how, how has the private sector really taken it as well? Well, I thought my colleague, um, we'll who is the lawyer, would pick up on that. But I think <laughs> yes. you are right Before in the sense that the, I'm... Uh, the legal, yes. Yeah, you see, you see I, I think one is to have the right laws to manage the system. But then the other one is enforcing those laws. In fact, for quite a bit of time, we have been uh, always been told the fact that the problem is not the law. Look at any broken system. Um, look at our anti-money laundering uh, system. Mm. The problem is not the laws. We possibly have laws that can reasonably um, govern us. The problem is at the point of enforcement because we fall flat on enforcement. So by tightening the laws, you're not achieving anything. Because if you tighten them and you're not enforcing them, you are really making no progress. But I think if we just enforced the existing laws, even up to 70 or 80 percent, we will be there. Because you have got good laws in almost all areas. And for that, I think uh, my colleague will bail me out. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> I hope. I hope so. I may disappoint you. Because you see, the uh, ball. It is very simple. As Kenyans, we like bribes. As Kenyans. An average voter is bribed to vote. An average member of parliament bribes his way or her way to parliament. Same to a governor, same to the president. Uh, use money 
in use of fundraising, whatever it is, we are a system that uses inducements to get anything. Now, if that is our common denominator, why are we surprised that bribery is high? Because if we were a people who loathe corruption or loathe bribery, you would be seeing incidences. Remember when Kibaki came and he had zero tolerance for, 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 for corruption? Remember how people used to arrest police taking bribes? That was short-lived. Because we thought we were very enthusiastic. People said, now let's, let's now do what is needed. Within a very short time, life went back to normal. That's the nearest we came to wanting to deal with corruption. After that, we've never seen any regime after Kibaki and even this one that is interested in dealing with bribery. Because even where you see centralization, why would you ask that a person in a village in Barak uh, Muluka's village in Manulia should pay fees to the school that's next to them there through pay bill, the, the, this is double two, double two, double two, whatever it is. Uh, what are we talking about? You know, we have official corruption where we are doing things that subvert what we know and we are not saying anything about it. No. Look at affordable housing. You and I are told to pay tax because it's affordable housing. The story being said is that this is an employment scheme. It's not even affordable housing, but I'm paying for it. Houses are being brought down, and we are saying it's in the name of affordable. Why if, why if you are interested in building houses, why would you bring down even one house, especially if it's a quality house? Then you are giving land, public land, to private developers for free. Then you are using taxpayers' money to develop the, the, the houses. And you are selling it at market rate. What is corruption? Where, what else do you want to say is corruption? And I'm saying that on the national uh, TV. What, what, what is that? So we, we, you are subverting the normal processes. If any of us here wants to buy a house, we know you take a cop loan, we know you go and buy a piece of land, then you start building, then you own a house. It's not any of those mathematics that you're saying that you're waiting for government to put up a house and you want to buy it. When, since when did the government become uh, a developer? We would have things like uh, public-private partnerships. And there is money, and uh, uh, my colleague Habilia will tell you, if there was money for development and you ask banks to do it, they would bring the money. Money is available to do the right thing, so you don't even need to put public money in it, you don't even have to tax it. But the way we have sold it, the way it has been packaged, you cannot define it in any other way. There's no logic in economics, there's no logic in governance, there's no logic in taxation, and, and Professor Iraq is here, is the, is the, the expert on those things. Where you do what we are doing, and you think it will not uh, encourage people to be lawless and people to be, uh, you know, reckless. So, when Mithika Rindudu speaks, you would be excused to think that he just arrived in Kenya, he doesn't actually know <laughs> what is happening. Uh, so the things we do are mockery. So that what if we sit here and tell ourselves that, oh, this corruption is very bad, we should do something about it. We are deluding ourselves because the very fabric of how we are now running business is corrupt. And that's going to be the, the way for the foreseeable future. Nobody. It is disheartening to hear that. Yeah, uh, I mean, that everyone is giving up. Uh, it's not it's going up. to be the way. This is the way how we do it. This is the reality on the ground. It takes government. Despite to the deal fact with that we have a report here, so it doesn't make any discernible difference at all at the end of the day. It takes government to deal with corruption. Does this government have the, inter the, the intentions to deal with corruption? I say it doesn't. If the government itself is corrupt. Yeah. Can I can I react to that? Because I I, I think my colleague is is very. I, I like your analysis that. You have hit the damn nail on the head to 
to talk like an American. Mm. When Kibai came to power, one of the things I remember in his speech was him saying, corruption will stop being our way of life. And to some, some extent it stopped. Mm. So I think what we are missing in this country, in my opinion, is political will. I think everybody knows there is corruption in this country. But nobody has the political will to face it head on. Mm. Number two, and I've said this in many, very many occasions, I think we are suffering from national immaturity. Yes. Because if you look at the way the corrupt views that are, that are reported, it just shows that we are not politically mature. We are not mature to think or, or to do things in a mature way. Because even a stupid person can add zero to a, to a procurement. So it's, it does not need a lot of sophistication. Mm. So let's call corruption what it is. It's part of national immaturity. How do we deal with it? I mean, I'm not giving up. Mm. One reason why we are becoming more and more corrupt is because the economy is not growing fast enough. So there are very few economic opportunities. So they are being auctioned. Very few jobs, very few promotions. So if people want to be promoted, if people want jobs, and there are very few, how do you give those few jobs? You auction them by paying higher corruption. Mm -hmm. So if we made the economy co uh, uh, grow faster, there will be less corruption. And number four, and uh, you are royal, the more we make tighter rules, the more it becomes sweeter to be corrupt. Yeah. So let's give people freedom. Let's have less control. And I'll give an example of NTSA. I don't have a matatu, but I'm also now concerned about NTSA. Mm -hmm. Because once they go on the road, they have been told to go there. Mm -hmm. I'm here, they will stop me. And believe me, they will see a problem in my car. The other day, a policeman stopped me and told me that my car was dirty. <laughs> and <laughs> it was true. It was, it was, true, it was dirty because <laughs> it was raining. So let's, let's have less but control. A you know, having a, a dirty car is a traffic offense. I, I didn't know that, but I'm not <laughs> having it on. So one, 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 way reduce, one way to reduce corruption <laughs> is to have less controls. Because the more controls you bring, the sweeter it becomes to be corrupt. So they, they are both uh, judicial, technological, yeah. and the political ways to reduce corruption. But we cannot give up. This is our country. Mm -hmm. And I don't think any of you is invigorating no, no. time soon. In fact, one of the things you said about that bill, uh, which we didn't talk about, uh, is perhaps what that like, guy was This doing. is what uh, Habil was actually... Yeah. yeah. What that MP is doing is saying Asking it could be right. Mm -hmm. It could be right, because there are a number of things we are doing in the name of corruption, mm -hmm. uh, or rather, there are a number of suits that we're bringing to court in the name of corruption that d don't really add up to, to a crime. Uh, I have been cases where, for sure, when you bring 50 or 20 or 30 you know, entities, people, and you are saying that an offense has been committed, you are not preparing yourself to prosecute to an end to anything. Because with 50 people accused, with about 20 lawyers appearing for each of them, that process will take a minimum of 6 or 10 years to even just get through mm -hmm. the process. So you really are not interested. And if, if, if and something happened today, you prosecuted tomorrow, and it takes another five, seven years for it to conclude, you can as well expect that that is not an impact. So there are some things we can do. For sure, a lot of uh, what we have called corruption in the name of procurement can be things that can be handled administratively. If you have faltered, we should surcharge you administratively and ask you to pay. We don't need to go and waste our time in court uh, you know, uh, paying for services and so on. So there is somewhere we can also go to improve how we, we manage this. We have argued, or I have argued in other forums, that when you want to solve a problem like corruption, you don't externalize it the way we've externalized. By creating a commission in order for you to deal with corruption is an admission that you don't know how to deal with corruption. <laughs> we created, and the, Professor, you'll, you'll remember this. We created, because we were so concerned about poverty, mm. more we created the Poverty Eradication Commission. <laughs> yes. That's still active. That commission never eradicated. I've never yeah. seen the one person who ever came and told me that yeah. their poverty was eradicated because of that commission. I think also it was uh, under Kibaki's administration. I remember, he, yes. It first started with Moy and then Kibaki. Yes. It's still there. You know, on paper, it's still there as a prostitute. Though Jesus said uh, the poor will always be with us. Yes, but, but <laughs> what we're saying is... is we, shall have, we shall have started from that premise. That the spirit you know, of uh -huh. He will tell you that it takes a martial plan. It takes a government action to deal with corruption, to deal with poverty, to deal with the development. He's talking about let's create... You see, if we, were pur we purpose today to create an environment where private sector is thriving, where merit is thriving, 
where uh, hard work is paid, then people would work. If people don't require a lot of government, a lot of laws, no. People just require incentives and balanced incentives. I need to know that if I can, if I produce, I should be able to reach that market because I know I have a market there. You lay the road for me, lay the, the infrastructure for me, I'll get to that market. That's what private sector wants. That's what a normal human being wants so that the government is less and less intrusive. The more government wants to do things in the spaces of private sector, the less incentives there are and the more perversions there are in terms of corruption and so on. Maybe if we come to you, uh, Dr. Habil Olaka, because the question of uh, still corporate governance, we have sustainability reports that you normally, uh, of course, we have corporates now issuing sustainability reports on how they're tracking with the sustainability issues, especially with the ESG. But when it comes to corporate governance, do we normally have, or is there any stimulation that can come from the private sector that some of these corporates from the private sector, the public uh, sector think them they can han handle that differently, but from the private sector also the corporate governance report that also is celebrated who is having a good corporate governance index in the country. I've never seen that being really sort of given a, a premium focus that we can weigh and raise the, the conscience and awareness regarding these corporate governance issues that are very key. Because I think it all begins from there. If at all we have a structure and we have good corporate governance uh, watchdogs, so to speak, then maybe that also can bring some modicum of difference in fighting corruption. Yeah, you're right, in the sense that I'm, uh, you see, most corporates will usually be driven by the profits because yes. you're under pressure from your investors, from your stake, mm -hmm. from, from your shareholders to return a profit and justify their investment in the corporation. So we tend to be driven by profits. And what tends to happen is that it's profits at all costs. Mm -hmm. So you at are, all costs. irrespective of how much damage you're doing to the environment, irrespective of how much damage you're doing to the social fabric, you are still chasing profits. Mm. Now the whole thing about the ESG yes. is to enable institutions to balance. Profits are important, yes, but you also need to be concerned about the environment, you need to be concerned about the social fabric, you need to be concerned about your corporate governance, which means that um, you should be able to balance between the stakeholders' interests and the other interests as well. Mm -hmm. And that's why organizations that are really focused on the ESG uh, framework are doing much better because then you have got a positive uh, return mm -hmm. to all the various stakeholders. So institutions that are really focusing on, uh, on, on ESG and for that matter sustainability yes. are a step ahead in terms of their relevance in the economy and also in terms of the actual contribution to the economy. And by contribution we, do, we mean not just profits uh, to the investor as a shareholder but their contribution to the rest of the society in terms of sustaining the environment for our future generations and in terms of ensuring that the social fabric is maintained for purposes of ensuring that you've got an environment that everybody benefits. So I think from that perspective, the private sector has been driving the ESG agenda quite well to the point whereby I think the other sectors need to come and crowd in to ensure that we all are being driven by the same, uh, same agenda, same objective, of ensuring that we don't just all focus on profits for the sake of you know, satisfying our shareholders and our investors, but we ensure that the community in which you operate is also benefiting from our economic activities. We are also preserving the environment to ensure that the future generations have got as much a right to a conducive environment as we do the current generation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm inclined to wonder then, when it comes to ESG and uh, issues to do with the, the reporting, the sustainability report, what sort of indices that uh, you're looking for? Because there's, there's, there's no ironclad metrics that is there that can actually substantiate that what is on the report is a reality on the, on the ground. And there's a lot of greenwashing that really comes with uh, this sustainability report that we see, oh, this uh, farm has reported uh, this is their sustainability report. Mm. But how then do we, uh, would we have any robust met 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 metrics and indices to measure so that we know what is clearly on the, 
it's not all about just uh, green washing, but it can it is reflective of what is on the ground. You're the one who's talking about extractives, uh, mm -hmm. so you're extracting from the environment. But how also are you making sure that there is remedial, remedial action to making sure you, you replenish the same environment that you're extracting from? So, in terms of matrices, could you just paint for us how then do we? And I think this is is in line with auditing processes at the mm -hmm. end of the day to confirm mm -hmm. that. What we have on the report is a reality on the ground. Yeah. I, I think it's, 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 a, it's an evolving um, framework. You, you see, initially we just had the usual annual reporting, which is purely financial. So you will see um, the metrics that are measured in there is the return on investment, um, uh, you know, the look at the profit as a proportion of the total investment by the shareholders, and that's the number you report. And that's the number that IFRS, for example, has really focused on in terms of, you know, what you report to the shareholders and even the general public. Then, because of the development of sustainability as a concern in terms of businesses and the need for you to report to the various stakeholders, there is a development whereby institutions who are not just reporting the financial annual report, but they also attach to it a sustainability report. So that then you've got your normal financial reporting and then you've got the sustainability report that also tries to give color to the financial reporting. Now that slowly is evolving into what you call integrated reporting. So that your actual annual report, in it has got the sustainability measures. So that when you're talking about return on investment, it's not just a financial return on investment. You're talking about the return on investment from the various um, uh, perspectives in terms of return on investment and as relating to the, to, the, to, the, to the environment, as relating to the social fabric, and as relating to the actual um, uh, investment in the organization. So we have got what you call the triple, uh, triple, triple, bottom, line. Tri triple bottom line, where you're talking about the profit, planet, and, and, the, people. Um, and, um, and the people. And people. Mm -hmm. You see, now that's, 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 that's a, a matrix that can give you a number that does not just represent the profits, but also incorporates the people and incorporates the planet as well. So it's an evolving um, um, reporting framework, and we now have various uh, reporting frameworks that are coming up to sort of like support that kind of thing. And you've got, for example, the task force on climate-related financial disclosure, mm -hmm. which is bringing in um, the institution's ability to manage its climate risks. Mm -hmm. We also have task force on nature-related financial disclosure. Mm -hmm. And they are all coming up with the templates in terms of how to report your activities in terms of conserving nature, for example. Now, when all this finally boiled down into our normal uh, IFRS reporting, which is now combining all this into one, we'll now have a framework whereby we'll be able to see from one number how an institution is not only looking after its profit, but is looking after its profit, uh, after its planet activities, and how it's looking after its people's activities. So it's an evolving reporting framework, but I think we're on the right path. Mm -hmm. We're on the right path. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So there's still some tricks that needs to be done uh, as well. Mm -hmm. Right, you wanted to say something? I think what, do, what, what Dr. Abel, Abel is, is telling you, uh, uh, what he is telling you clear is that the age of faceless capitalism, the age of profit at any cost is coming to an end. And that's what we are addressing. That if you are going to make this profit, we must know whether you hurt somebody by making that money. So if a company is mining titanium or mining gold or mining anything in this country and they are making super profits, we want to find out whether some people are poisoned downstream. We want to know whether the society where that mine is, is located is benefiting. And I'm a, I'm a keen supporter of this approach. Because in the past, companies just wanted to make money. But they did not think about the consequences, both short term and long term. So, so this is a, an initiative that we should support. But he put it very clearly, it is evolving. Mm -hmm. Even in the school of business, we are not trying to address that issue. Because traditionally we taught young men and women that the purpose of the private sector, private companies, is to make money at any cost. Mm -hmm. We did not bother much about the soft issues. And it's good these two gentlemen are sitting together because for you to implement ESG, mm -hmm. you need some changes in law. So you are not just going to force companies uh, to, for example, rehabilitate a mine mm -hmm. or make sure the river is not polluted. They, 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 are going to not, they are not going to reduce their profit unless they are forced by law. So ESG and changes in the legal system should go together.
but they should, should be symbiotic. Mm -hmm. and, and, and governance, because the ESG, the G in the ES, ES is a governance, is governance. And that governance now extends beyond the private sector yes. to now where the public sector sits. Mm -hmm. In a good world, it's the business of the public uh, sector to help put in those regulations and to police the regulations to ensure that no harm uh, is uh, caused in the course of making profit or doing business. So that the same argument will then apply even to the public, that to what extent is the governance of a country also concerned, concerned about the people, the planet, mm. and benefits? Because at the end of the day, governments do not exist to do business, but they exist to ensure that there is enough to help uh, take care of it, so, uh, their people. So yes, the triple bottom line, uh, principle is something that uh, we are all now consciously coming uh, to terms with. When you look at the global trends, the private sector across the world has the money and has the muscle that a bit of responsibility and more of care for people and the environment would go a long way in making a difference look at uh, Microsoft, when you look at uh, uh, Bezos, when you're looking at the, the net worth of the big enterprises, uh, they make uh, a country like Kenya look like uh, a small uh, you know, company somewhere. <laughs> so for that reason, they have they can fund our budget. Yes, and, yeah. uh, and therefore, if you, if they can be responsible. company can fund the entire budget of a country. Yes. Yeah. So they are if they can also be responsible and make sure that they're looking at profits, yes, but people are looking at the planet, then we will see more. So that international regulators, international community, and governments work to enable. So that when bi what businesses are saying, give us the environment. We Indeed. will do the right things. Right. So the reason uh, also I wanted to just uh, navel gaze on the bit of the sustainability report, we have NEMA which has listed some of uh, two blue chip companies in this country, right, that are listed also in the NSC. But they're flagged as polluting, you know, uh, Nairobi River. Yet these two companies also, they give out their sustainability report. And this is where I'm wondering, where is the dichotomy? You have your sustainability report, then we'll have, you know, an agency in the country which is concerned with the environment flagging you as being a perpetrator uh, or and a polluter of the rivers in this particular country. That's what I was asking. As you say, this is still evolving, but mm -hmm. some robustness, this uh, dichotomy in this reporting and this, the reality of the ground at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So where, what are the metrics so far that you think are robust to make sure that there is, there is a misreporting somewhere? So that you may just yeah. be fulfilling what, what <laughs> ticking the box. You, know, you have a sustainability report. Then after that, we have yeah. never now flagging you. Hey, hey wait a minute. <clears throat> Despite the fact that you have your sustainability reports, which is not indicating that you are also polluting, polluting this particular river. Mm. You know, Debal, I think you are right, and you had raised this point earlier about uh, the role of in terms of, of audit. Yes. You know, to give assurance to the public that the information you are reading meets some required standards. And we have got that, for example, for the normal financial reporting, the normal annual report. It has got some specific standards, the international financial reporting standards, that then the auditor gives assurance to the reader of the financial statements that these statements have been prepare, prepared in accordance with some specific standard. Now, as I mentioned, the sustainability reporting is currently more or less on, a, on, 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 on a, you know, you, you elect to go that route. And currently, we do not have um, sort of like standards that mm. somebody can audit against to ensure that you are reporting as per given standards. It's yeah, more no or less, standards yeah, yeah. You are venturing into that area. You want to disc you want to become clean. You want to report to the public that this is what I'm doing in this space. So, what is the yardstick for, this, for these reports? That, yeah. That's my worry. What's the yardstick? Eventually, uh, that's what I was saying. That is, is evolving because eventually now we are seeing some specific standards coming in. We now have, for example, under IFRS, we have got IFRS S1 and IFRS S2. And those are standards that are being developed to ensure that the sustainability reporting is following some specific requirements. So then it becomes easy for an auditor to 
hold you to account to the fact that this is what you are meant to disclose and is missing in your report. So you can even qualify your statements because you have not followed some specific requirements. But as I mentioned, this is this is this evolving. The S1 and S2 standards have just been issued. So entities are now beginning to adopt them and start reporting based on that. So if we fast forward, maybe in another five years' time, mm. when we'll now all be required to report as per a given standard. Now you can then have the auditor giving us assurance that these statements you're reading are actually prepared as per that standard. And if you know what that standard requires, then you can now be sure. So the case you mentioned of an entity that is listed and is not following some specific requirements because it's polluting Nairobi River, for example, that will be clear in their statements if they are reporting as per the IFRS S1 or S2. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Uh, I want to just, uh, before we wind up on this uh, issue of uh, governance, because we are fighting corruption, the academia. Mm. Where is the place of academia in, in fighting corruption in this country? Because it seems also uh, that everyone does not seem to be concentrated on the social sciences, which will try to, you know, instill ethics, uh, raise issues uh, to do with, uh, you know, social engineering. Mm. Because this is a matter of social engineering that we need just an overhaul. Do we wait for a generation exiting so that also the coming generation will pick up on a clean slate where, you know, they, they are alive and fully attuned to the fact that, uh, you know, corruption is a vice? Or are we also perpetuating the same, same, same vice with the, with the oncoming generation? How, where do we begin from the place of you professors? He, he, the doctors he, in the university, because yes. it, it, I mean, all this will is interconnected in one way or the other, right? It's such a tangled web of, you know, tissue that we need not to untangle. W w one of the greatest ills or mistakes you can make in the university is to steal other people's ideas. It is considered that the highest, uh, the greatest height of dishonesty and, and integrity. Well, academic so, integrity. Okay, integrity. So there is an attempt to make sure that people present original work as much as possible. There is ethical basis upon which research I'm, is I'm not even talking about that uh, but academic integrity. I'm talking yeah. about the professors in universities coming up with curricula and giving concentration, right, yes. o on the issues of social sciences because I, I don't think that is given much premium. We go <laughs> for, yeah, we go for the lawyers. Uh, we go for the businesses, right? No one is really talking about uh, I, I, I social agree, sciences. I agree, but then this is where now academia would, does not have one solution. For example, you will find that kind of uh, stuff in the philosophy, in the religious, and uh, perhaps the you know theological school, or you will find that curricula in sociology and maybe even politics. But you see. What we should be saying is, for example, let's look at the overall CBC. To what extent can we look at CBC and say it integrates, it, it, it integrates aspects of social, moral, uh, you know, training so that uh, an average Kenyan who has gone through the CBC is able to pick that up. Now, unfortunately for us is that not 844, not the previous system, was able to look, and we hope that with CBC we can be able to look at some of these functional issues because CBC is then supposed to be functional, it's supposed to be competence based, and that we can build in these things as we go along. So, yes, as we review our curricula, particularly from the primary coming into the secondary, there's an opportunity for us to infuse. Remember, a lot of times academia responds to the needs of society. Right now, we are looking at uh, social ills. We are looking at corruption, we are looking at gender equality. There are a number of ills or injustices that academia responds to. And you respond to it with either a curriculum or respond to it with a, an institute, for example, an institute of development studies or population studies. We are saying the issues are material enough to warrant concentration and allocation of resources. So that is happening, but I think it could more could happen, especially if the academia what to season, what was to provide us the, the, the salt for the world. Because right now, this world, and particularly this country, needs more seasoning. 
than you would think uh, that than is available. So we need it from academia, we need it from religious institutions, we need it from private sector. We need to learn from everybody how not to do things. You know, we compare ourselves with countries like Singapore and others. Those countries, it is integrity and moral probity above anything else that has make, made them stand out. But that to us is our problem, that we can do everything else, but we will be the first ones to bring it down. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes. Yeah. Oh, I will, uh, maybe, okay. Maybe, maybe, I, maybe since we are on academic part, I can finish. Then you can. Okay. Uh, I, I, I was actually getting concerned a bit earlier because mm -hmm. our uh, Dr. Haraka was getting too much. He was carrying too much weight, so I can see you have distributed to us. <laughs> 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 <You're very good. laughs> the budget. Yeah, I think to respond to your issue about academia and uh, the problem of corruption, let's start by looking at our past. I think one of the things that nobody has said publicly in this country is that the reason why corruption is so prevalent in this country is that it's not actually seen as corruption. It is seen as helping. If I went to my village and picked 50 men and made sure all of them got to police, got became teachers, joined the military, and another 50 went abroad. And I was able to, to go through corrupt means, get their passports, get their letters of appointment, I would be a hero. So, Corruption in this country is not seen as bad, but as positive, helping some people. Mm. And that's one thing we forget. And as long as we don't change that perception, that it is good these 50 young men got jobs, but how many other people lost? And what are the consequences of getting unqualified people into the system? You keep talking about it. In, in academia, let's talk about academia. I think there's been a, an attempt in the past to infuse this thinking about corruption into academia. I don't know how old you are, but you probably, some of you probably did a course called Social Education and Ethics in high school. It was done for a number of years, then it was removed. And I remember, I always find this joke very funny. There was a leakage in an exam in KCSC in a national school on Social Education and Ethics. <laughs> so I think the question is not <laughs> teaching these things. It is leaving these things. And in academia, whether you're in engineering, whether you're in law, whether you're in sociology, I think we should get time to infuse these values and this new thinking into our students. So that if we are talking about medicine, can you spend a few minutes talking about the ethical part of it, the value part of it, and the consequences of being corrupt and doing the right thing? If we can do that in every, in every subject, in every profession, then in the next 10 years you start seeing some change. But it's also important to realize that academics should not, be, should not be following, they should be reading. So that if there's an issue of corruption in this country, we should be the people coming up with solutions, telling the government, telling the church, telling other institutions that we think these are the best solutions. But for us to do that, we need to be funded because I'm not going to sit and think for 10 hours with an empty stomach. We need the society to support us as we go through this. And I'll give you a good example. I was asking some, uh, some teachers last, last week a very simple question, whether they have heard of protestant work ethics. Mm -hmm. And one of them teaches CRE. And uh, he told me, no, I've not uh, heard of protestant work, work, ethics, work ethics or work ethic. But we know about senators, we know about governors, we know about the American political system. But we don't know about the protestant work ethics, which is what has made America what it is, that work is honorable, that work is godly. But here we avoid work by all means. So I believe that from primary school to high school to university, this positive aspect of life are that people should be rewarded for hard work. Mm -hmm. Work is not something to run away from. If we started infusing uh, through all the subjects and all the curriculum, I think there can be a change. And the most important, let's be proactive. And finally, I think the problem of corruption will not be solved in academic rooms. Mm -hmm. It will be solved by the voters. Because, see, who controls, who, who, we have anti-corruption commission and we have all these other bodies, but who polices them? Mm -hmm. Who polices our parliament? Mm -hmm. Who polices our presidents or our presidency? So if voters in this country became more active, they realize that once we vote these people into parliament, in county assembly, that's not, not the end of the story. We must keep on watching them. Mm -hmm. Then you see some change. The, 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 the readers will change and that change will start diffusing into the rest of the society. Fantastic. Ready for, you wanted to say something before we take a short of briefly? Yes, short um, just very briefly. You know, sometimes uh, when you're seated in uh, a panel of such eminent uh, professors, you know, oh, sometimes to, to it's, not good, <laughs> it's, it's not good to expose your ignorance. <laughs> 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 I'm 
so I was a bit we careful will, we will uh, on, 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 on how to go about it because, uh, you know, in, in Kenya, actually, you've got an institute called Kenya Institute of Curriculum Development, mm -hmm. and I would not want to venture there to advise them on how to do it. But I was just recalling, you know, if you look at when I was in primary school, there are some things that we were taught, like civics, mm -hmm. and those lessons are still running in me today. Mm -hmm. Now, I was just thinking about, you know, things like, for example, the, you know, the government structures in terms of there is the legislature, there is the, you know, the, 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 uh, the executive and the judiciary and all that, you know. Now, I was just thinking at that point, at the same level, if the curriculum can be introduced so that these things we are talking about, ethics, things like corruption, are instilled in these children at that level. It can even be through rhymes and all that. These things stick in the mind, and as they grow up, they actually live by those values. Not necessarily because it was formally put to them, but they start, and Professor mentioned about, you know, the fact that it's not an issue of teaching. It's a matter of people living by acting by those, you know, living by those values. And I think instilling this in those kids at that level will make them grow into human beings that you expect to be productive, members of the society today mm -hmm. and avoid some of those vices that we are now struggling mm -hmm. to overcome. Right. Yeah. We do for a station break. Uh, even as we're doing that, uh, just briefly, I'm just reminded of the credo of John D. Rockefeller, where I can just read a little bit of it as we take a short break. He says, I believe in the supreme worth of the individual and his right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I believe that every right implies a responsibility every opportunity and obligation, every possession or duty. I believe that laws were made for man and not man for the law. The go that government is a servant of the people and not their master. I believe in the dignity of labor, whether with head or hand, that the world owes no man a living, but that it owes every man an opportunity to make a living. I believe that thrift is essential to well-ordered living and that economy is a prime requisite of a sound financial structure, whether in government, business, or personal effort. I believe that truth and justice are fundamental to an enduring social order. I believe in the sacredness of a promise that a man's word should be as good as his bond, that character, not wealth, or power or position is of supreme worth. I believe that the rendering of useful service is a common duty of mankind and that only in the purifying fire of sacrifice is the dross of selfishness consumed and the greatness of the human soul set free. I believe in an all-wise and an all-loving God named by whatever name and that the individual's highest fulfillment, greatest happiness and widest usefulness are to be found in living in harmony with his will. I believe that love is the greatest thing in the world, that it alone can overcome hate, that right can and will triumph over might. John D. Rockefeller, we take a short break. When we circle back, we want now to never gaze on what is happening on the banking sector with the supernormal profits. Uh, so far, Habil Olaka will give us a picture there. We can see also in this time when jobs are not there, one of the banks, Absa, is actually also opening so many branches so far, 15 uh, to count and still counting. We shall be looking at that, what is informing all that as well. Don't go away, you're watching Sokoni here on Morning Prime. KTN News. Get the whole story. NBA. Take a date with Cristiano Ronaldo and Golo Kante as the Saudi Pro League returns. Excitement. Boom. Goals and millions of emotions. Who will be the ultimate Bundesliga champion? Absolutely unbelievable. 